really one of the one of the key contributors in deep deep knowledge about the language. Um, in talking with Mark over the last year or so, we've I think between us sort of realized that there's this really interesting um, uh, common set of interests between building secure systems, which is what Mark's interest is in, and building very small systems, which is what Modable's interest has been in. And so this, I asked Mark to come and talk with us because um, there. The, the work he's doing that he's going to present, I think, really kind of embodies both of those and also helps answer or provide a direction for answering one of the challenges that we face where we want to be able to uh, eventually safely run, you know, untrust, effectively untrusted user code in uh, JavaScript engines on embedded devices. Um, and clearly the, the security concerns there uh, are significant. The trust concerns are significant. So I, I won't say more. I'll, I'll just turn it over to Mark, and I will go from there. OK. Um, and uh, just about to flesh out the background that you mentioned, I've been participating in TC39 since 2007. Uh, when I got started, the standard JavaScript was ECMAScript 3. Uh, and we were battling over whether or not to do ECMAScript 4 uh, and ended up with uh, ECMAScript 5 instead. Um, uh, uh, which uh, quite on purpose pointed us in the direction that makes the security properties I'm about to talk about possible. Okay, so I titled this talk, Omit Needless Words, um, uh, because uh, it's about this discovered alignment between the omissions that I've been trying to enable uh, in order to create secure subsets of JavaScript uh, and the engineering for running on smaller sizes, smaller size ROM and RAM, especially uh, for devices uh, that Modable has been explaining um, uh, to us and our joint realization that so much of our engineering was aligned and pushing in the same directions. Uh, and I want to say that uh, there is, uh, while I'm still on the title slide, um, I want to raise, but, but not revisit really during the talk, uh, that the issue of devices is not just aligned because of smallness, because of the need to occupy less RAM and less ROM, uh, it's also aligned, I think, eventually, because insecure devices can kill us. Um, uh, this group, as I understand it, is about devices and wearables. Clearly, wearables are the first step towards implantables. We're going to be entering a world in which we'll, we'll probably all have lots of implantables implanted in us. And if they are operating at the security level of current computers, I think we should all be quite terrified. So the main methodology that I've been pursuing, I like to use the phrase, uh, don't add security, remove insecurity. That the essential object computing paradigm that JavaScript embodies quite well, that object computing paradigm taken by itself is already a very good model of modular secure computation. Uh, the notion of memory safety, of object encapsulation, of, um, of invocation as message passing where the receiving object reacts to the message only according to um, its code and uh, where it can only cause effects by using references that it holds. Uh, these are all perfectly aligned with um, the access control model called object capabilities. And the reason that uh, our object languages are not good at security is because of all the additional stuff that's been added beyond the core object paradigm. So rather than adding a whole bunch of new mechanism for security, my emphasis has been to 
add means to remove the things that cause the insecurity and to remove them in an enforceable manner. So uh, I'm going to take us uh, through several subsets of JavaScript. Um, uh, so at the smallest subset that we're all, is one that we're all familiar with, which is JSON, which is a tiny subset of JavaScript whose emphasis is only data, uh, and it's become a universal format for safe mobile data. And part of what makes it universal is that uh, uh, it is trivial to parse. So no matter what the language and no matter what the platform, uh, everybody felt empowered to go ahead and write their own JSON parser. Uh, now, it's not quite trivial to parse correctly. Uh, so a lot of the uh, massive adoption of JSON were by parsers that were slightly incorrect. Uh, but that's often the way massive adoption happens. Um, uh, on the um, completely opposite side of the scale, there's the full ECMAScript standard that was constrained to be upwards compatible with all of the legacy uh, ECMAScript 3 stuff that existed at the time that I joined the committee. So it contains both strict mode and sloppy mode. And sloppy mode really is incredibly insane uh, and really should be thought of as existing only as an ECMAScript 3 compatibility mode. Uh, with ECMAScript 5 came the definition of strict, which is a saner subset, uh, in particular saner, saner subset that enables the creation of uh, the secure subset, the enforceable secure subsets. So the focus of the talk and the focus of our work at Agoric will be on SES, which stands for Secure ECMAScript, which takes advantage of um, the mechanisms introduced with, uh, with ECMAScript strict and the mechanisms introduced into JavaScript standard since then, um, uh, so that you can have um, multiple mutually suspicious uh, featherweight compartments um, uh, uh, confined boxes in which code can execute and in which mutually suspicious code can be put into contact with each other in a controlled manner so that each can protect itself from the misbehavior of the other. Um, uh, but to do so in a featherweight manner because as opposed to, for example, with iframes or full realms, where all of, this, all of these compartments are sharing one set of primordials, one set of global objects. Um, and this fits very well with the constraints um, that the modelable guys have explained to us of XS, where there, in fact, is only one root realm. In fact, SES does already successfully run within XS. And then uh, I'm going to explain a very small subset of SES named Jesse, which is intended to be, um, to serve a role like JSON, but for universal safe mobile code to where Jesse is a sufficiently small subset of SES that in the same sense in which everyone felt empowered to write a JSON parser in whatever language, Jesse is a subset such that it becomes um, uh, straightforward to write a simple eval apply interpreter of Jesse, uh, no matter what your language and what your platform, so that Jesse becomes a format for sending uh, code with the security properties of SES, but easy to interpret on any target. Uh, the alignment with uh, this group uh, is that uh, SES um, uh, has a lot, of, SES has a lot of the benefits that the modable guys 
have, have had directly on their radar with regard to freezing all the primordials, freezing many objects, uh, reducing RAM footprint in that manner, but still with a ROM footprint uh, for the ECMAScript interpreter itself, which is essentially the whole language, and a, a ROM and RAM footprint that, that supports a lot of the mutability of the language semantics, much of which is unnecessary for writing good code. Uh, so Jesse is also one that should reduce both ROM and RAM footprint uh, significantly compared to SES. Um, before going on, I want to introduce two new terms um, which will be relevant for understanding all of this mechanism. Um, XS right now has this notion of a deep freeze uh, expressed in a non-standard manner. Um, uh, SES introduces two concepts, uh, harden and pure, and they're very closely related to each other. They're sort of two separate concepts that together give you this notion um, uh, uh, that's like the notion of the excess deep freeze. Harden is for tamper-proofing an AI, an, I'm sorry, an API surface. And it does it by recursive application of object.freeze, where object.freeze is not making something immutable. Uh, it's uh, making properties non-configurable and non-writable, making the inheritance chain not mutable. But for example, when you do an object.freeze of a function that encapsulates mutable variables, uh, the object.freeze does not prevent the function from mutating those variables. Now, um, so, so the way Harden works is it's, is it's a transitive application of freeze that does its transitivity by walking properties, by, um, by traversing uh, from property to property to all the things that are reachable just by property traversal without invoking any of the functions of the objects being traversed. So it really is not about immutability, it is about tamper-proofing surface so that um, uh, between mutually suspicious objects, uh, one subsystem can expose defensible objects to another subsystem. Um, now, under certain conditions, when you harden an object graph, you actually cause it to become pure. And what pure means is that um, uh, this definition comes from the use uh, in the Wyvern language. Um, uh, in Joey, we called it uh, immutable. In, um, uh, but what it means is um, that there is no mutable state or IO anywhere to be found in that object graph. And therefore, that object graph is itself something that can be placed in ROM without needing the extra bookkeeping for shadowing, shadowing those objects with mutations of those objects. Those objects are semantically, um, have no encapsulated mutable state or IO abilities, and that's no ability to either cause effects on the world outside, nor abilities to sense effects from the world outside. Okay. So now to take you through uh, the subsets. Uh, the subsets nest. Um, the uh, subsetting that we um, uh, uh, those of us who've, who understand the um, JavaScript 
uh, in some depth, uh, the subsetting that we know well is the difference between the full ECMAScript standard versus uh, the ECMAScript strict subset of the full ECMAScript standard. So the, the things shown uh, in this Venn diagram uh, between each contour, between the ECMAScript box and the ES strict box, are all of the things omitted from ECMAScript to get to ES strict. And so that will be following that graphical pattern throughout. And we're also using horizontal versus vertical. I don't know if you guys can see this based on where the um, uh, zoom control is. Um, but the horizontal arrow at the top of the screen is labeled semantics, and the vertical arrow on the left side of the screen is labeled syntax. So we're going to be using horizontal and vertical in order to, in order to notate the difference between uh, semantic subsetting and syntactic subsetting. So uh, uh, the full ECMAScript standard contains with, that's a syntactic element that is statically omitted uh, from ECMAScript 6, I'm sorry, from ECMAScript strict, uh, and the full ECMAScript standard contains the uh, crap on the right that I won't go into unless anybody has a question, but those are the elements from sloppy mode uh, that are omitted to make ECMAScript strict mode. Um, so zooming in, what are the things we omit from ECMAScript strict to make secure ECMAScript? And it's really um, three main concepts. One is uh, this issue of the primordials. Let me define primordials. Um, uh, primordials are all of the objects that are mandated to exist before code starts running, uh, except for the global object. For, for reasons that will become clear, we omit the global object itself from our definition of primordials, but object, array, uh, object.prototype, array.prototype, um, array.prototype.push, and all of the other method objects. So that whole object graph of objects that exist before a code starts running, those are all primordials. And when, um, uh, according to standard ECMAScript, including ECMAScript strict, those are all mutable. Those can all be mutated. And therefore, the XS engine, um, uh, when just running standard JavaScript, has to pay tremendous bookkeeping overhead to enable any of them to be mutated, even though almost all programs never mutate any primordials. Uh, in which case all of that bookkeeping uh, is essentially wasted space uh, and wasted time. The, 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 to go through the extra bookkeeping every time you access a property uh, is also costly of runtime. Uh, uh, there is, for the realm as a whole, a single global object that contains, so that's the per realm global object at the bottom, and that contains both the ECMAScript standard uh, primordials, primordial globals like array and object and function and JSON, et cetera. But it also contains host provided globals like in the browser, um, uh, window and document, uh, an XML HTTP request uh, in node, um, uh, process and require, um, and then through require various modules that give access to the file system. So these are basically uh, sources of authority, sources of the ability to cause effects on the outside world, which all code has access to. And because all code has access to it, it means uh, everything is vulnerable to all code, that there's pervasive vulnerability. 
Um, uh, and therefore, every time you build an application uh, in JavaScript for, for any hosting environment, um, uh, and this includes in the current status, um, uh, the embedded with XS, um, uh, in the current situation, all of the authority that is provided by the host by populating the global object is available to all code, including all third-party libraries that are, that are being linked in because they all have that global scope in scope and can name any of those objects, which are the ability to cause effects. So removing those concepts, oh, I'm sorry, and then, so let's take a little detour. So th this is uh, an example of some of the primordials there's a particular uh, subset of the primordials that we distinguish, which are called the undeniables. And we distinguish them because they're reachable by syntax. So no matter how initialization code might try to change the primordial namespace before freezing it by replacing object or function or replacing object or prototype, array dot prototype, et cetera, uh, uh, code by using literal forms, an object literal, a function literal, and a array literal uh, can directly reach uh, things like array.prototype, object.prototype, etc. So those cannot be denied by simple monkey patching, by simple customization of the primordial object graph. Uh, the global object is the one that has um, uh, the bindings for the, um, the elements of the primordials that have global names. And then among the primordials, we distinguish two particular kinds, which are the evaluators, uh, which evaluate code in a scope where the free variables in that code, the, the, the variables that are used in the code but not defined in that code are instead looked up in the global object. So evaluators are scoped to some global object. So with those concepts in mind, let's return to our subsetting diagram. And if, if we remove those three concepts <coughs> from Secure from ECMAScript uh, strict, we end up with secure ECMAScript. So, where ECMAScript strict has pure has mutable primordials, secure ECMAScript has pure primordials. And what I mean by pure, we 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 cause them to be pure mostly by applying harden. Um, but one of the things that we've done over um, uh, the entire time, starting with um, uh, ECMAScript 5, is with the exception of, uh, a, with, of um, a very small number of grandfathered bits of implicit mutable state, which we can ignore for present purposes, uh, with the exception of those grandfathered bits, we have constrained the primordials so there is no hidden mutable state, such that if you harden the primordials, the primordials become pure and therefore rommable. Uh, uh, so uh, secure ECMAScript has uh, all the primordials are pure. And instead of having one global object for the realm as a whole, rather we, ha we have an ability to create compartments where each compartment has its own global object. Um, uh, so let me, uh, uh, by way of notation, uh, mention that the, uh, I'm using underbar in the subsetting diagram for new concepts that this talk is introducing that are not concepts that are already present in ECMAScript itself. 
Um, another uh, concept that uh, we are we will be introducing with a separate proposal. It's a proposal that fits with SES. Um, it has a natural synergy with SES, but it's this proposal that stands on its own, um, uh, uh, which is defensible classes. Um, uh, that's going to be introduced with the at def decorator. Um, uh, uh, for those who don't know about decorators, I won't explain them here, but the point of a defensible class uh, is, again, a hardened API surface. Uh, a defensible class is like a normal class, except the constructor, the prototype, all the methods on the prototype are all frozen. Uh, so the transitive API surface of the constructor itself is hardened. And in addition, the instances made by the class are hardened. Uh, uh, that does not, uh, uh, for the class as a whole, if there's no uh, hidden static state, which is typical for classes, hardening the class makes the class pure. For the instances, um, uh, the instances typically do contain, or typically will contain, uh, hidden in per instance state. So hardening them um, tamper proofs their API surface, but does not make them pure. So the instances typically will not be ROMable, but uh, the classes themselves will be. So, in SES, uh, we initially defined, um, defined this through the, the original Frozen Realms proposal, where the primordials start out frozen. And what we found was there is one kind of code which, follow, which does exist and is important and is con now considered to be uh, um, uh, code which is part of best practice, which are shims, shims that run ahead of time and customize the environment. Um, so uh, the way we currently define, uh, S I'm, I'm not going to distinguish SES and Frozen Realms. Uh, there's the Realms proposal and then Frozen Realms and SES are now merging. Um, uh, but SES uh, is defined such that vetted shims, trusted shims, can be run ahead of time prior to freezing all of the primordials. And I was very pleased to read recently about the XS preload logic, and this is almost identical, and I think they can be mapped to, onto each other rather perfectly, where the shims are run without access to any external mutable state or I.O. devices, they're run confined, and once they're done, they're done, uh, and therefore they can all be run at build time in a device environment rather than at runtime. Uh, and then the resulting primordials that result from that customization can then be snapshot, snapshotted, placed in ROM, so that only the things that are different afterwards uh, become the things that need to be need to reside in RAM. Um, so uh, now I'm using um, the gray background to indicate the objects that are placed in ROM. So in this case, um, the full set of primordials are placed in ROM or are, are completely frozen and pure, and the um, the the uh, objects that are don't have the gray background um, are in these yellow boxes, each of which is a compartment. So a compartment, each compartment has its own per compartment global. The evaluators for the compartment, uh, the eval function and the function constructor, are evaluate code only within the scope 
of that compartment's global. Um, uh, and uh, these compartments uh, all inherit from the same set of primordials uh, so they can, so the code with, loaded in different compartments can be put in contact with each other and interact perfectly well. And if they harden their API surface before they're put in contact, they can also defend each other from each other's misbehavior. Um, even when a hardened object is not pure, I want to emphasize that that itself reduces the need for runtime bookkeeping because the properties, the data properties are now only writable. They are not configurable. Uh, and therefore there's much less bookkeeping needed in order to provide for the runtime representation of a non-configurable mutable data property. Um, uh, likewise, a um, a, a, um, a function that uh, an, a, a non-writable, non-configurable, mutable data property that, in, that holds a function that encapsulates state, uh, once again, it's not placed in ROM, but there's much less runtime bookkeeping that should be needed. Okay, so um, uh, back to our subsetting diagram. So the elements that are in the yellow or the light green are the elements of secure ECMAScript, um, which enable tremendous amounts of existing JavaScript code that obeys best practices to run as SES code. Um, and the experience both at Google with Google Kaha, which contained the earlier version of SES, and today with a Salesforce that is running a 5 million developer ecosystem on top of the modern version of SES. Um, uh, both of those experiences, and, and as well as our experiences so far at Agoric, um, uh, which granted are, are uh, currently at a much smaller scale, but all of those experiences verify that uh, leaving aside trusted shims for doing a pre-freeze customization of the environment, that, a, that um, aside from those, a tremendous amount of existing JavaScript code that obeys best practices runs in SES and therefore can be separated and protected from each other through the means already explained. Um, now, Jesse is intended to be a tiny subset of SES that is not intended to support existing legacy JavaScript code. So all of the elements uh, in yellow and light green, we remove them um, to make Jesse, uh, and that includes some elements of the SES runtime, uh, uh, including uh, uh, property reflection, um, uh, various things that make implementing uh, ECMAScript uh, burdensome, uh, and most radically of all, uh, uh, Secure ECMAScript has this and new and instance of, uh, as well as classes, all of which is in support of defining objects by inheritance uh, and the support for mutable properties. Um, uh, we omit all of those concepts to make Jesse. So in Jesse, all objects are hardened. All properties of all objects are um, non-configurable, non-writable, um, and all modules are pure. Um, uh, so, um, and we'll, we'll come back to the modules in a moment. Uh, in the absence of inheritance, 
the pattern of objects that we're using is something called the objects as closure pattern. So Jesse code um, uh, uh, is not allowed to count on any of the things outside the Jesse box. However, there's a bit of a um, definitional oddity uh, in the definition of Jesse, which is Jesse is a sub is purposely a subset of SES. So we define the Jesse language such that a correct Jesse program must remain correct if run as an SES program within an SES system. And therefore, a correct Jesse program may not count on the existence of the, the full SES runtime, the elements that are outside the Jesse box, but neither may a correct Jesse program count on the absence of those things. And therefore, a defensive Jesse program must defend itself under the assumption that the adversary might be coded in SES, uh, but still um, under the assumption that the adversary is coded in no more than SES, because SES provides all the restrictions needed such that Jesse objects can protect themselves from SES objects. And therefore, Jesse code can run on incredibly tiny standalone Jesse interpreters, but they can also run uh, within a full SES environment without needing to make, without needing to introduce any mechanism to distinguish Jesse from SES. So, removing the syntactic elements of SES, most of which um, uh, um, were either in support of inheritance or like switch fall through was just a foot gun, just uh, something that was accident prone um, uh, and something that, that good code should avoid anyway. Um, uh, what we're left with is uh, 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 Jesse contains JSON, and therefore it contains string, strings and uh, objects and arrays, null, true, and false, numeric literals. Uh, beyond JSON, um, it contains, as I mentioned, pure, pure modules with import and export that we'll come back to in a moment. Um, uh, it contains most of the operators, and pointedly, it does not contain double equals, and uh, but it does contain triple equals because once again, double equals is just just makes code um, uh, unreliable and should never be used by code following best practices. Um, uh, strangely, Jesse omits proxy itself because proxy is hard to implement, but proxy and weak map were introduced into JavaScript uh, in order to support the creation of membranes. So uh, Jesse, while omitting proxy, uh, will directly have as part of its available runtime a membrane library because that is very supportive of uh, security patterns uh, and in a standalone Jesse environment where all objects are hardened, the subset of the member of the membrane concepts, which are meaningful in a standalone Jesse environment, are easy to implement. Uh, so all of these things uh, um, uh, should admit to a fairly straightforward eval apply interpreter uh, as um, uh, that can be. Uh, essentially um, uh, um, uh, ported to many conventional um, uh, imperative memory safe object languages by writing a simple val apply interpreter. And um, 
Michael Fig is collaborating with us and has created a project called Jessica, which is a self-rehosting meta interpreter of Jesse in Jesse, and he's already partway through a uh, using it to do a rehosting of Jesse into C, um, uh, but without yet having done the C runtime elements. Um, needed to uh, support Jesse objects uh, within a C system. Um, uh, but that gives, I think that gives a um, uh, very good uh, sense of, um, uh, if you take a look at what he's doing, it gives a very good sense of how tiny the subset of XS would need to be in order to create an XS that supported only Jesse. So, um, so returning to our, con our concepts of harden and pure, in order to explain our modules, uh, we need to, uh, the modules admitted into Jesse, uh, as well as the, most of the modules that will be useful in SES, uh, the key thing is to write modules in a form that is statically verified as purifiable. To actually harden every exported value of every module by explicitly using harden, even though harden is a very nice abstraction over object.freeze, it is still notationally awkward, sufficiently notationally awkward that um, uh, programmers will resist uh, putting in the necessary hardens, and it does create a readability burden. So instead, we define this notion of purifiable and a notion of a pure loader. So um, uh, modules export and import, um, and a pure loader is one where in order for a module to be loaded by a pure loader, the module has to have passed a static verification that it is purifiable. And what purifiable means, I'll just I'll give the definition first and then I'll unpack it. What purifiable means is under the assumption that everything the module imports is pure and that everything the module exports is hardened by the loader that the consequence is that everything the module exports is actually pure, and therefore any other uh, purifiable module importing from this module is importing only pure values. So uh, now I'll unpack that. Uh, so export function make point. Make point is just a function. Um, as interpreted by a normal ECMAScript um, module system and module loader, uh, make point is not hardened, it is mutable, and therefore it is not ROMable. Uh, however, um, the, the modules are the wiring between modules, the, the, between the export, the imports, the ex, the imports of one being wired to the exports of another goes through a loader and the loader can intervene on the values uh, that it's wiring from one module to another. So uh, without any further explanation, um, we can see that make point itself, if hardened by the loader as an exported value, uh, becomes pure because the function 
clo is uh, closes over no assignable variables, uh, and in f and uh, in this case, it closes over no variables. Harden itself is understood as a special case by the static checking. Um, if it did close over any variables, we would, we would need to ensure statically that the variables were not assigned to and that the variables were themselves initialized only to pure values, not to purifiable values, but to actually pure values. Now, this function, when invoked, will return a hardened object, but not necessarily a pure object. That does not prevent the function from being placed into ROM. Uh, now, at the bottom, um, we import the value xs, xx, from a foo, a foo module, since the assumption is that we're being loaded through a pure loader that enforces that it's only loading purifiable modules and it hardens all of their exports, we can assume here uh, that XS, XX itself is a pure value. And then uh, through our static checking rules, in this case, and this is where the static checking rules get admittedly delicate, we can, because makepoint is defined within the same module, we can, in this case, verify that if both x and y, if both of those values are themselves pure, that in that case, the instance, the hardened instance returned by makepoint is itself pure, and therefore the export const pt at the bottom can still passes our static check that the, that point instance is, um, is purified. Um, uh, if we were passing into makepoint something that was not statically known to be pure, then we would not know that the point being point instance being exported was purifiable, and therefore this module as a whole would fail the static check, and a pure loader would refuse to load it. And uh, I think that is. Uh, the end of my prepared talk. There's lots and lots of concepts here, um, and I am now prepared for uh, questions and discussion. Thank you, Mark. That was um, <clears throat> a lot. Uh, it's great. I mean, very. I, I've. Um, it's good. It's it's the third or fourth time I've been through this material in various forms, and I'm starting to starting to feel comfortable with it. Um, uh, it's, it's a lot, we should open it for questions. I, you and I have had a chance to discuss this stuff before, but other, other folks may have something to say. I think one of the things I've, I've liked about the work that I've witnessed the last two days, and just as I read up on your uh, October minutes, I think what's made this group so effective is that where there's a, a, an existing industry metaphor paradigm to, that can be applied, that is easily understood, universally understood, both in context and syntax to adopt it. And um, my question is just, is how consistent is this uh, uh, in approach? And is there a competing approach that uh, you would consider um, for security? Um, so, there are a lot of claims out there. Um, the I have enough academic papers and um, uh, various talks that are recorded and up on the web uh, and lots of other material that I can cite that I feel comfortable 
now simply making the strong claim that um, there is no competing approach to the approach taken here that provides anything like the level of security that this provides. Now, this is not uniquely the only, so by the approach, what I mean is the object capability approach. Uh, so, so in particular, uh, the transition from ECMAScript strict to SES, um, that there are many other approaches to security that have tremendous things to say to them. Uh, now, some of those can be combined with object capabilities, uh, and SES is not uniquely the only way to get from ES strict to object capabilities. Uh, so with regard to a lot of the particular design decisions uh, to get from ES strict to object capabilities, um, uh, there is a design space there. Uh, and we made a bunch of choices. I am not aware of anything out there that is trying to provide object capabilities for modern ECMAScript strict, uh, which is a competitor. Uh, the key phrase in there was modern. Um, uh, the old SES in Google Kaha was defined uh, mostly as a object capability subset of ECMAScript 5 and has led to other work uh, and both it and some of that other work uh, uh, does show somewhat other ways to get from ECMAScript strict to SES but nobody has attempted to reproduce any of those for modern JavaScript. Um, so that was a long way of saying, uh, no, there's realistically nothing competitive with this. And we are pursuing this through the Realm proposal and then uh, following it uh, with the SES proposal, which is what Frozen Realms is mutating into. So that's all standards track. Uh, separately, we will be proposing Harden as, um, uh, as a standalone uh, proposal that can be used both inside and outside of CES, uh, as well as defensible classes as a standards track proposal. Uh, and, and this follows a long tradition. Most of the elements uh, that we've used to get to where we are, uh, including promises and proxies and, and uh, weak maps and et cetera, et cetera, uh, were already introduced standards track in order to enable the building of SES. Mark, oh, sorry. Uh, I, I think this is a really great, uh, a great thing you've got there, and I can see lots of applications of this. Um, I'm, I've got far too many questions to ask in a few minutes, but probably the the highest level question would be, uh, how does this interact with? Uh, so, so what you've got here seems to be protecting some JavaScript code from, or some not quite JavaScript code, from invading another piece of code within the same realm. And I'm wondering how this interacts with uh, the case where you've got some code uh, that you want to access, you want to have, you want to enable it to access particular I/O devices, uh, say through an import or something like that, and then another piece of code that you want to either enable. With different I/O access, or you want to restrict I/O access. Uh, so that the, the way you've described it, it seems like you're restricting access to globals. But what about imports? Um, and okay. especially in the case of I/O imports, that would be uh, not pardonable by by definition. I think. Okay. Uh, so uh, excellent question. Um, uh, any object capability system uh, has to solve the problem of. Where does initial authority to the outside world come from? And how is it um, propagated through the system in a safe way? Um, uh, the, so we're, so uh, uh, I put pure modules uh, into the Jesse box, but not the S, but the SES box supports uh, modules that are not pure. We're working now 
but are still on a, in a per compartment basis. So we're working, uh, this is work in progress uh, with the, um, uh, the SES uh, group that uh, Salesforce and uh, Node and GoDaddy and uh, uh, several other uh, players are all are participating, um, uh, MetaMask, um, uh, in this uh, SES group. Uh, and our main topic uh, is the uh, safe module system for wiring up and propagating through initial authority in a way that enables the programmer to express least authority. Uh, so there is this famous recent incident um, uh, called the event stream incident, where a module known as event stream, a, a package, an NPM package known, known as event stream, um, uh, was changed uh, by the person who inherited its maintenance, uh, was changed to be malicious in sneaky ways in order to steal the Bitcoin of an application that was linking in that module. And that was um, uh, uh, necessarily easy in current JavaScript um, because of the pervasive access to the genuine global object and therefore to all authority. Uh, this is our test case um, for designing a system that can support legacy code and provide individual modules and individual packages with least authority. So the way we do that is partially through a manifest um, uh, um, that uh, says how different uh, packages can be wired to each other, which is basically a constraint on the import graph as well as a partial redirection of that import graph. So very concretely, um, uh, if module foo import, does a import or a require, I'm not going to distinguish import and require because we're looking at, at node code right now. So things that are expressed that, we, that uh, um, would be expressed in import are currently expressed as requires. Um, uh, so something that requires FS, uh, the manifest can redirect that through an attenuating module that imports the real FS and exports an attenuation of that FS that presents the same API but gives access to only a subset of the files. Um, likewise, uh, the per compartment globals, you can redirect the definition of the values of global variables uh, through attenuating modules uh, as stated by the manifest. So the manifest can work with legacy code, but the basic idea is that each compartment becomes a separate protection domain uh, that is populated with the least authority needed by the package loaded into that compartment. Uh, and then you express uh, constraints on the allowed import graph so that basically each compartment has its own global as well as its own loader. And the loaders of the compartments know each other and enforce the constraints as well as this rewiring through attenuators. Um, and the result is that uh, other than writing new attenuating modules and writing this wiring manifest, most of the rest of the code uh, can be legacy code. In addition, um, uh, um, uh, Bradley Mech of um, uh, GoDaddy and Node is working on a Tofu tool, trusted on first use, to automatically generate the information needed to generate the initial manifest and attenuating modules so that you can start off with attenuations that provide the packages with what the authority that they currently seem to need, but no more. 
which in the case of the event stream incident uh, would have caught the uh, upgrade, uh, the malicious upgrade of the module to use authority that it didn't previously need to use and was not previously using. Thanks, that was, that was very clear. And uh, we will be making the, the um, uh, uh, I, can, I can forward to this group the current draft of the safe module <coughs> proposal, uh, but keep in mind that it is rough and, and this working group is continuing to work on it. Well, one reason I'm interested in this is this is whole evolving larger uh, JavaScript ecosystem with browsers, node, and everything. But, uh, what other efforts outside this ecosystem are there for this kind of portable safe code? And what other, you know, environments are there? Uh, I'm That's sorry. Th or the comp comp competition question. Uh, so uh, we're talking to, uh, so um, let's see. So uh, Salesforce is currently using it in the browser. Um, uh, 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 Goric, my company, uh, is as well as MetaMask, um, who are um, participating in the working group, are both looking uh, to use this uh, in the blockchain ecosystem. Uh, in the case of Goric, we're, use, we're, we're looking at it in a node-like manner to run on the server side on top of blockchains themselves. Uh, in the MetaMask case, uh, they're looking at it primarily for the browser side uh, for creating a, sec sec a secure user interface system for interacting with distributed applications, applications that are themselves running on existing blockchains. Um, uh, uh, we're talking to Bradley, as I mentioned, about uh, using all of this directly on Node, and there's there's um, uh, uh, and that's what it would take to address things like the event stream incident. We're getting a lot of interest in being able to write um, uh, server side code, Node side code, in a more robust fashion, uh, which this would enable. Uh, and we're talking to Brave about a multi realm manner that in a more radical, um, in a more extreme fashion, enables legacy code to be secured uh, by combining the SES mechanisms with the full realm mechanisms, where you create multiple confined realms which are not frozen, but which are only given least authority, and put between them uh, security enforcing code that is itself created in an SES realm and therefore can protect itself from malicious code on both sides. So it allows the mutually suspicious code to be full non-defensive legacy code, but interacting with each, o with each other only through new defensive SES code. Um, okay, I, no, I appreciate this. I think that there's a lot of discussion on portable code of things I'm interested in. But my question is other languages and other environments oh, you know, oh. that are trying this kind of thing. Okay, um, so non-JavaScript. Non-JavaScript. Okay. Um, uh, so at the fine-grained per object level, uh, there's very little happening in industry uh, for um, uh, object capabilities at a parser level. Uh, there's a lot going on, basically um, uh, something more like what I described as the uh, brave use case, where you have pro where you or, or the or an operating system like use case, where you've got processes interacting with each other by object capability rules rather than conventional rules. Um, uh, the um, uh, SEL4 uh, is a um, uh, extraordinary secure 
high-performance operating system built by object capability principles, in fact, very similar object capability principles. Um, uh, and it is the only, today, it is the only practical secure operating system that has been verified correct um, uh, at a, uh, at a, for a very, very different example, uh, there's Cap and Proto uh, and the Sandstorm ecosystem built on top of Cap and Proto, um, uh, where you've got um, uh, processes in Docker in, in Docker-like containers. They have their own container mechanism uh, that's Docker-like, but where they talk to each other through the Cap and Proto protocol, where the Cap and Proto protocol uh, both has a protobuf-like serialization for serializing objects by copy, but has exactly an object capability protocol for invoking services. And that's actually based on my previous work on CAPTP, uh, which we're redoing also for SES in order to create a distributed SES. Uh, okay. Yeah, we don't have time to talk about it. I'm very interested in continuing this when there is time because these are topics I'm very interested in. But I'll give this back to Peter for now. Okay. So, uh, Mark, I, um, I, I wanted to ask maybe a, a slightly practical question out of all this. I was, um, I was interested particularly by your comment that um, you're, you have some experience with SES in the, in the wild using through Salesforce. And if I recall well, what you said is that um, you characterized it as the majority of kind of well-written code. Um, not, the, not, the, not the majority. I mean, if I, okay. I, 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 might have, I might have said that or implied that. Let me backtrack from yeah. that. Uh, the, uh, it's a tremendous amount of existing code written to recognize best practices. And when I say recognize best practices, I'm, I'm speaking of already recognized rather than something we're proposing to be new best practices. So the primary uh, best practice, uh, it, well, the primary two best practices is all of your code should be strict and you should not monkey patch primordials. Uh, and that's why I had to exempt shims. Shims are the one case of mutating primordials which are considered to be within current best practices. So leaving those aside, code that is written only to strict and which does not mutate primordials, a tremendous amount of that code is already uh, uh, SES compatible. And it might in fact be the majority, I just don't have uh, any measurements to justify making a claim that it's a majority. Okay, that, that's fair. I think the clarification is helpful. So where I was, where I'm going with that is this, this committee is embarking on what is effectively uh, a new target. And so we have, uh, I can safely say, relatively little legacy code compared to the web um, to deal with. And so there's, uh, as you were talking, the question sort of arose in my mind, if we optimistically assume that SES exists you know, down the road as part of the standard. Um, should we as a group be thinking, gee, maybe SES should be the default runtime model that we target for devices? Um, and you did, you did a wonderful job in your opening slide of adding the word implantable to scare us all to death about uh, <laughs> how serious the work is. Um, do, you, do you think that SES is sort of an appropriate Given this, I mean, still somewhat nebulous, or not fully defined, not nebulous, um, do you think that's something we should be looking at or considering as a reasonable baseline target for delivery of the work that we're doing? I do. I do. I think for a new platform where you're not burdened with a tremendous amount of legacy code, uh, that everything that's in JavaScript that's outside of SES I think for a new platform is useless. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll make that statement unqualified. Um, uh, the, um, uh, in addition, uh, going back to the terror of implantables, let me mention another design point of Jesse for which we're working on it, but it's still too early to make strong claims. 
is uh, um, uh, Alan Schmidt on the committee from J the JS CERT project in INRIA uh, has done this extraordinary, well, the whole JS CERT project um, has done this extraordinary work doing a mechanized formal model of uh, JavaScript as a whole. Um, uh, SES includes most of JavaScript, so a mechanized formal specification of SES as a whole would be somewhat smaller, but would still be most of the size of the mechanized specification of uh, JavaScript. Uh, and even though he has a mechanized specification, because of the complexity of JavaScript, it has to be a low enough level specification that it's not very useful for proving security properties of realistic code written in JavaScript or SES. One of our design targets, a very important design target, especially for us in the blockchain world, is we intend to write all of our smart contracts in Jesse and to recommend to our users that they, rec that they write their smart contracts in Jesse, even though we provide them all of, S all of CES, uh, so that we can support formal analysis tools that can verify, give you a static verification of interesting security properties of code written in Jesse. Uh, we're working with um, a group of academics, uh, um, uh, Sophie, Drus I'll just name drop, uh, Sophie Drusopola, um, uh, James Noble, uh, Toby Murray of the SEL4 project, um, uh, on a specification language called Chainmail uh, that is not in, that assumes a abstract object model as its uh, code model of what it's proving properties about, and is really focused on the mechanism of specification and proof. But we believe that it can be composed with Jesse eventually in order to provide mechanized proofs of interesting security properties of Jesse programs. Okay, excellent. So, I mean, it's an intriguing, uh, backing up a little bit, it's a very intriguing um, thought that, um, that there may be a, a subset that's an appropriate, uh, an appropriate one for us to look at. We'll, uh, I mean, we'll, I think we all have some homework to do just to catch up on what that would look like and the implications, but um, very much appreciate the introduction today. Rick, you were holding something up to the screen and I didn't look soon enough. I just wanted to check if you had anything you wanted to add before we closed out this topic. Oh, my notes that I took uh, during Rick's talk, I wrote down, should we require strict mode? Then I wrote, no script target, only a module target. And then eventually I wrote SES and put a big circle around it. <laughs> uh, for, exactly, for exactly the reason, uh, Peter, that you said, uh, it's it's very nice to to be able to unburden ourselves from the the one JS doctrine, um, right? Which is to say, like we're not we're not going to like disable break things that have existed forever because there's this world of code, uh, you know, extant software that must continue to run properly on some bank somewhere in some time that, you know, would be a disaster if we were to break it in, in our efforts in TC39. We don't have that, that burden uh, in TC53. So it seems to me that, that we should take the opportunities uh, to, to create a, a both expressive platform, but also secure platform. And, um, uh, as I said yesterday, you know, I've been on TC39, uh, a delegate to the committee since 2012. So I've been working side by side with Mark in that time. And I've come to uh, have a great deal of respect for, for the work that Mark does. And more importantly, the, 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 the approach, the strategy that he takes, uh, which is, I was summed up very nicely in a slide that you had early on, which was don't like, don't try to like, make security take away insecurity. I think that that's brilliant. Um, see, I'm, I'm really all into this and I love the idea of uh, like, we don't even have to worry about Appendix B.
Yep. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, just like, uh, even, even, even if it turns out that, um, like, obviously we need to experiment with this, uh, like put it out there. We're not going to make any decision rashly or, or, or prematurely, but I, I would say that even if, uh, e- even if, if we find ourselves in a position where like, that maybe it's too restrictive for one reason or another. Now I'm not saying that that is even uh, a scenario that we will encounter just hypothetically. Uh, I see no reason why we couldn't, um, and like make rules that say, uh, strict mode only, you know, like this, we, we have the authority to do that. And we have the authority to write tests for conformance of that. Uh, Rick, thank you very much. I appreciate all of that tremendously. You're welcome. And thank you so much for, uh, for doing this, this talk today. This is, uh, fantastic. I, I actually hadn't seen this one yet. This one's Mark, new. Uh, Mark, can I also ask you a question? So this is Ishtan. Um, uh, this Jesse, is, is it already also at TC39 or not yet? Or not, it will never come? Uh, uh, it is not yet um, uh, stated in a, in a manner appropriate for bringing as a proposal. Uh, but I would love to bring it as a proposal. Uh, and uh, uh, with regard to, for Jesse itself, whether it should go to TC39 or TC53 or somewhere else, uh, I don't have a strong opinion on that. I'm, I'm, uh, so your advice is solicited. Uh, but the natural thing for me, just based on my history, would be to bring Jesse as a proposal to TC39. Uh, but you, you said that it is not compatible with the rest of the of the onion, yeah, which is outside. It is not uh, compatible with ex- with existing JavaScript code. It is a subset of the outer parts of the onion. So anything uh, okay. so anything written in Jesse will run as SES, and any correct Jesse program by the defi- by the peculiar definition of correct Jesse will still run correctly when run as an SES program. Uh, so uh, we have that direction of compatibility, but there's essentially zero existing JavaScript code which will run as a Jesse program. OK. So then I have a last question, and then, then probably also the time is over. So, so practically, you are uh, restricting yourself as you go more inside of the, of the onion. Yes. So, is there any 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 um, any, any uh, issue regarding performance or any other restriction that, for instance, when you have a code with Jesse and in comparison with a with, with a code which is outside in the in the onion, but it is not so secure. So, uh, the, 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 I'm sorry. Did somebody else have some? Was somebody else saying something? No. Okay. Um, so uh, we're currently using the Realm Shim, both uh, at Agoric uh, and at uh, Salesforce uh, and at uh, MetaMask. Um, uh, the, uh, for the Shim, th- we're encountering two sources of overhead. Uh, one is that the mechanism we're using to intercept global scope references so that we can do a per compartment global object is a width on a proxy. And we're doing a mechanism to make that efficient in the typical case. But when uh, uh, there is this optimization mechanism, but when a global variable reference misses the optimization, misses essentially the optimizing cache, which happens quite often, Uh, there's a substantial overhead of going through the proxy mechanism. Uh, With SES directly supported by the platform rather than as a shim, that overhead goes away. Um, uh, The other source of overhead is the override mistake. Um, uh, And uh, that is irritating. It is not so irritating as to be an impediment to practical use. Um, uh, Salesforce ha- is, is in deployment uh, with paying the co- both of these costs, uh, and they're not finding either of these costs to be an impediment to practical use. There is a proposal be- before the TC39 committee 
uh, to fix the override mistake in the standard. And if that happens, then that source of overhead goes away. Uh, however, it's not known how web compatible that is. If in TC53, we can somehow, we can somehow allow ourselves to run SES with the override mistake fixed, then again, that should, be a, that should have no cause of overhead. Um, so uh, taking care of those two, there's one remaining source of overhead that's worth calling out explicitly, which is the objects as closure pattern for expressing objects has an allocation cost and therefore a RAM cost. So it's quite relevant to this committee where you have to uh, allocate a closure per method per instance. Now, my e-language and a previous proposal that I had made to the ECMAScript committee back in the transition days from ECMAScript 5 to ECMAScript 6 shows that it is possible to implement objects as closure without that space overhead, but it requires um, uh, some re-engineering of the object runtime. With current object runtimes, you have the allocation cost of a method of, of, a, of allocating a closure per method per instance. That's significant RAM. It is not significant runtime for object, for object abstractions that are written well, and what, but that's a weighted definition of well. What I mean by written well is object abstractions that don't have a tremendous number of methods in the equivalent of a single class, but rather have lots of small classes, each of which have, have small numbers of methods. Excellent. Um, so again, thank you, Mark. It's um, I mean it's it's, it's uh, tremendous to have have an opportunity to hear you present this and um, get the ideas kind of firsthand from you in, in front of this group. And um, good news for you, our next meeting in four months is scheduled to be in the Valley, so we uh, we may be able to follow up in person. Great. Uh, but anyway, I'm sure we'll be um, talking in various forms between now and then. So thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thank you for inviting me to do this. This was a wonderful opportunity, and thank you for letting me record. Yeah, we uh, Patrick will ask. We'll follow up. We would should get the presentation to put in the notes and share with other folks as well. Okay, great, great. So um, we're uh, we ran a little long, which is fine. I want to take a break until three thirty when we'll reconvene, just because I need to stand up and stretch for a few minutes before we keep going. Okay, so I will stop the recording and sign off. Thank you.